Okay, so I'm going to invite you to uh, pay attention here. And we have uh, a lot to go through and a lot of material. So what we want to do is discover if there's any hidden anchors weighing down your equity curve. So please remove all distractions to make the most of our time together. What I want to do is start with a personal story. In 1988, I started my own trading firm and had been trading for several years. It was in the middle of the night of April of 1995 that I awoke with a start. A voice, not mine, said, Rich, you're only worth 200000 a year. Now, I heard these words as clearly as could be. As I say these words right now, it, the hair still stands up on the back of my neck as I recall that night. I sat up in bed, and it was 3 a.m. My wife was sleeping peacefully beside me, and there wasn't anybody else in the room. So I got up, I showered, dressed, and I drove to the option floor of the Pacific Stock Exchange in San Francisco. I owned a seat there as an independent market maker. When I got there, the doors were still locked, so I sat on the floor and waited. First, let me give you some background. After successfully trading for a Chicago arbitrage firm for four years, I bought my own seat at the Pacific Exchange and went to work for myself. The first year, I was very, very careful. I didn't have the hundreds of millions of dollars in capital that I used to trade now that I just had my own account. So I was very careful and cautious, and I made 125000 the first year. The next year on my own, I cleared 150000 the third, 175000 And the following years, I paid out at almost exactly $200,000 every year. Well, that was until 1995. And that year, something very different happened. I was trading Micron options, and Micron was on an upward tear with exploding option volumes. There were only four market makers trading Micron regularly and the profits were just pouring in. I couldn't help but make money. By the middle of February, my account was up 200,000 for the year. In just two months, I had made as much as I normally made it in the whole year. At the end of February, however, my account was still at $200,000 and the profit opportunities continued. At the end of March, Micron's volatility was increasing. The stock was going higher and the option opportunities were growing. But my account was still only 200000 for the year. I'd make 5000 lose 3000 make 4000 lose 2000 day after day. Well, that brings us back to April of 1995. And for all the opportunity in the pit, my account profits hadn't budged. I was still up only 200000 and that's when I heard the voice in the middle of the night. Rich, you're only worth 200000 a year. As I mentioned, I got to the exchange floor so early that morning that the doors were still locked. When the doors opened, I went to the deserted pit and did something I had never done before. I stood in the best spot that would be in between the two busiest brokers and right in front of the exchange's order book official. In this spot, I could hear what was going on, and that gave me first crack at orders. Now, you need to understand that on a trading floor, no one owns a spot. It was appropriated by the toughest and most aggressive risk takers. They kept their alpha male positions by staying on top of the social hierarchy with various social pressures. Some commanded respect. Others ruled by fear and kept their place as a bully. Well, the other markets started drifting in, and it was a few minutes before the opening bell at 6.30, and no one gave much thought to my new pit, pit position. The guy who always stood there just stood beside me chatting. When the opening bell went off, he nudged me as he stepped into his spot. I didn't move. It was like a jolt of electricity went through the pit. A pushy, pushing match ensued. I pretended I was wearing concrete boots. The order book official quickly warned us to break it up. We could get a $10,000 fine for getting physical, but I remained in the spot. 
as the bell went off, I became a wild animal. You got to understand, I normally stood at the back of the pit and carefully calculated option values and took small bites out of large orders that looked over or undervalued. But this time, I bought and sold every series. I was screaming, waving my hands, buying and selling as fast as I could write the tickets. The pit thought that Rich Frenson <laughs> had lost his mind and gone berserk. And that year, I went on to make 650000 and for years after that. It turned out that I had an internal limiting thermostat set at $200,000. I was fighting my own brain. The voice in the middle of the night represented that limit. But once expressed, I realized it didn't apply to who I was anymore. So I took that capital and started building an options and equity trading firm. Some of my traders used my strategies and started making a lot of money. But a few would make some money and then lose it back and forth. And more option and strategy training didn't seem to make a difference. And then it occurred to me, what if, what if each of these challenged traders had their own limiting thermostat just like I did? Well, I was very fortunate in that my sister Wendy was a newly minted hypnotherapist. She was eager to prove herself in the marketplace, and she worked with my traders who were profit challenged. We discovered that the differences between the successful traders and the struggling traders was not the markets. The difference was the internal programs they were running in their brain. For example, out of love and devotion to his dad, a promising trader couldn't make more money than his father. Now, I know this seems irrational, and the trader wasn't even aware of this neme or neural meta structure in their brain. Another trader's mom and severely handicapped brother would demand care and support if he became wealthy. And to avoid this conflict, he just didn't make enough money to trigger that tension. A third trader grew up in West Virginia and came from a long line of poverty. His identity was that of a poor person, and the many, many zeros in his bank account went beyond his self-identity. So what stops you from making the amount of money you want? What are the chains that you have around your treasure chest? You might have a great strategy, the right tools, the right equipment, and yet you haven't reached the profit levels you want. Well, I'm horrified to find out that tr as traders resolve their negative behaviors, something is still missing. Many traders have the knowledge, the skills, the strategies. They know what to do, but somehow their equity curve does not reflect this. What's going on here? Well, this is the most typical equity curve of the members before they join the Mind Muscles Academy. The next most frequent equity curve is a steady, small losses, and the next is mostly a flat line. But these equity curves all have a similar impact. And this is why we have this conversation with money. There's only one metric for trading success. Trading is directly measured by money and profits. And if we have a conflicted relationship with money, it will impact our trading success. As we struggle without examining the roots of our internal opposing parts, like any habit, after re being repeated enough times, it becomes part of our life and even part of a survival mechanism. Struggle becomes the norm and what we're used to. Comfort with wealth and success is seen by our survival brain as a threat. I didn't believe this either, and you may not believe this, but as I built a trading firm with traders using my own capital, and I've analyzed 2,000 personality assessment, I've trained hundreds of traders and privately coached dozens more. I have never, ever had a trader come to me and say that the biggest issue was being comfortable with success. They laugh at this thought. Most traders, independent and professional, do not believe me when I suggest that a conflicted relationship with consistent trading profits and wealth is an issue. However, as we work together to understand how they sabotage their trading profits, a picture emerges about their conflicted relationship with money. I estimate that about 70% of the dozens of traders, both independent and professional I've coached, are impacted with subroutines running in their brain around money and wealth. As I work with my private clients, our course members, our group sessions, 
negative behaviors improve. At some point, the negative behaviors are manageable, but something happens, or rather, doesn't happen. The trader is unable to step into the master trader's mindset of being wealthy and maintaining consistent growing profits. The trader has nothing to step into. They don't have a clear vision of the experiences of the master trader's mindset with increasing success. And what typically happens is that as the trader becomes successful, the dreams of all those unfilled needs become a reality and the trader becomes cocky. I've seen this over and over again. The survival brain takes us to a place, cannot take us to a place that is uncertain, or from the survival brain's point of view, even dangerous. So this is why I've created an upcoming course called The Conversations with Money for Traders, Investments, and in fact, anyone in any profession who wants to improve their relationship with money. But more about this later. This is indeed the elephant in the room. Most traders are unprepared to fully own their own success and live with consistent growing profits. Their deeply rooted survival brain finds clever ways to avoid success and sabotage the equity curve. So, Fernando, let's pause here. Are there any comments or questions? Uh, so far, no. Everybody's really uh, listened to your words. Okay. So any, any comments, well, let's take a moment to see if there's any comments or questions. You can uh, mm -hmm. uh, type it into the chat box. Does this resonate with anybody out here? Or like myself a few, <laughs> many years ago, I would have doubted this. Does this seem totally crazy to you? And if so, that's okay to mention that. Because again, the conversation is where some of the real good gems are in a presentation versus me just talking to you. So we have two, three uh, questions here. Is the okay. method used NPL? NLP? NLP, sorry. Yeah, um, as a trader, I found different techniques to help the people who are trading my capital as traders on the floor. Uh, I've been through almost all forms of therapy from uh, an Freudian analytics to gestalt therapy to Reikian therapy to bioenergetics and to all sorts of physical therapies uh, and uh, finally landed at uh, Marin NLP and they found us and that gave me a structure to tie everything together along with my work in neuroscience. So if you look at my background, uh, NLP is kind of, you can think of it as the structure and the skeleton, and I've put my own personal stamp on it and added a lot around neuroscience. Good question. Another one, do all fears have the common root? Do all fears have a have common, common root? root? Yeah. Yeah. You know, the, the common root to all fears usually stems from beliefs and behaviors we adopted when we were younger. When I work with a client, I will often work with a physiology. I will notice the tilt of the head, the rate of breathing. Sometimes I can see the heartbeat on their neck. I look at their eyes. And oftentimes I can find a younger self in there that created a belief when we step through uh, one of their experiences. So the common core to fears is a belief or structure. We call these names our neural metastructures. These were created oftentimes when we were younger. They were created as a survival mechanism. They have positive intent for our lives, but they are now subconscious. And they now, like, for example, you know, trader after trader will say, I know what my strategy is. I know what my setups are. I know when to trade, but when I'm there, something happens. It's like something just takes over and I make an impulse trade or, or get out too soon or cancel my stop or whatever it is. And then I wake up in the morning and I say, why did I do that? And there's a good reason is that we have these old uh, neural connections in our brain, these memes, these neural metastructures that are being triggered and take over. Yes, there's another one that you're on the root. Um, how can we find the root of our negative behaviors? 
That is a question that we're going to start addressing. So let's hold off on that one and mm -hmm. let's see if we can address it in a bit, because I believe that is part of what we're going to be doing here. Okay. Okay. I have a couple of more here. Do you, um, uh, where is it? Um, do you attribute all bad PNL to psychology or how, when do you know it's about not having the training process? That's an excellent question. And what we have at Mind Muscles is something we call lucrative trades. And those are trades that are according to your setup. They have the right market conditions. Uh, you executed them flawlessly at the right time. And you allowed them to go to their either their stop or to their exit point. Once you've uh, executed perfectly, then you can see clearly whether or not it's your strategy. And so what the goals, one of the goals we have is to see what stops you from executing your trades and executing your strategy rather. Okay, so let's hold the rest of the questions for a little bit and then okay. move on here. And by the way, thank you so much for those questions because that lets me know about what direction or what to emphasize here. So keep them coming in and I'm willing to hang around afterwards if we have any leftover questions. So the traders I work with have dreams of success. Often those successes are seen as symbols of wealth. Other times they believe that success as a trader will satisfy unfilled personal desires. Many times these desired outcomes are even out of conscious awareness. As you look at this list, you may not believe me, but when we work, some of the unexpressed needs that people have, this, these are things that come up from real traders, both professional and independent traders. Other times, they believe that success as a trader will satisfy a need to take care of themselves and others. Many times, these desired outcomes are also out of conscious awareness. But in all cases, it still heads the market wins, tails you lose. You lose opportunities, you lose time, you lose money. You own the risk when your survival mechanisms are more comfortable with a struggle. The market owns your dreams. So let's pause again. Are there any other questions, Fernando, that have come in? Um, yeah, there's, uh, is losing always self-fulfilling? Is losing always self-fulfilling? We can't control whether a trade makes money or not. We can only control our own behaviors. So let's say we have a trading strategy that has profitable trades 60% of the time. The profitable trades are twice as profitable as the losing trades are unprofitable. So we got a winning strategy there. Um, so uh, repeat the question, I lost track of that. Yeah, is losing always self-fulfilling? Okay, right. So if we have a strategy and we have a losing trade within that successful strategy, then obviously uh, that is part of the strategy and it's a winning strategy and it's all good. Over the, but what is self-fulfilling is our behaviors. Are we executing our strategy? If we're not executing our strategy, then that is self-fulfilling. That is totally under our control. And one of the things at Mind Muscles Academy that we look at is what is under our control and not try to control those things that aren't, which obviously is going to not work very well, but to focus on what is under our control and create the behaviors that provide the, uh, the create the beliefs that drive the behaviors that are consistent. So thank you for that. Uh, another one, um, what do you mean exactly for a surviving mechanism? Something you mentioned okay. before. Yeah, surviving mechanism. So for example, well in fact, I have this example later on about a trader who had to work hard to make money and if he didn't. So I think that'll come up in that example in a little bit. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now I want to give some thought, and I want you to answer a couple of questions. First, are you ready to let go of your wealth constraints? Are you ready to be enthusiastically and embrace your identity as a successful wealthy trader? 
I'll give you a moment to think about it. And if you want to enter any thoughts about this into the chat box, that would be fine too. I'll give you a moment. Are you ready to enthusiastically embrace your identity as a successful trader? Next, I want to ask another question. What mechanisms do you use to stop yourself from successful trading? Do you know what these mechanisms are? Is it clear? That's what a, a big part of what we're going to be talking about today and in our course, Conversations with Money, is to invite you to step in to the ability to handle consistently growing profits and success. Our agenda today is to talk about just three of the issues that may impact you as a trader. These are major issues that keep coming up with my coaching clients and the students at the Mind Muscles Academy, and they make a significant impact on trading profits. First is our wealth relationships. Next is our internal wealth thermostat. And finally is guilt. So we're going to move through a lot of material, so let's focus together here. First, let's look at wealth relationships. Please type into the chat box the first word or the first couple of words or a phrase that describes the feeling you get from this picture. I'll give you a moment to do this, and Fernando, you can read to me what's coming in. Mm -hmm. What feeling do you get from this picture? Strategy. Mm-hmm. Leverage, challenge. Leverage, challenge. Isolated, planning. Isolated, right? Planning, game. Mm -hmm. Skills needed. Skills needed, okay. Many people looking at this picture will describe a social condition, such as the word that came up was isolated. Without any words, without any humans, just pieces of frosted and clear glass, the image will conjure up a feeling for many of us. How do our brains from even different cultures and languages make similar interpretations? Well, it turns out that we are hardwired from our primitive tribal ancestors. Now stay with me for a moment while we build a foundation here for trading issues. A deer looks around, sees other deers that look like her, and she feels safe and goes back to eating grass. We as human have the same pattern recognition DNA for safety as do our primitive ancestors. We all wanted to be connected to our community. We all want to belong. When I tell my wife that we've been invited to a dinner party, hey, Fernando, what is the first thing she asked me? Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> hey, honey, we're going to a dinner party. What does she, what does she say? What should I wear? What should I wear? Why? When I go to a business meeting, I want to dress like everybody else. And there's a good reason for this. The primitive parts of our brain want to feel safe. We all want to belong and be accepted. Differences from our community, from those we care about, trigger survival mechanisms and create survival stress. Now, this doesn't seem rational, but it's true. So like the deer in the African plains, we check for safety by checking if others look like us. These people here are very safe. If you don't look like me, we can become dinner. Your primitive brain immediately sorts for threats. A study published in the New England Journal of Medicine involved a detailed analysis of a large network of over 12,000 people who they had been following for 32 years. The investigators knew who was friends with whom as well as who was a spouse or sibling or neighbor and how much each person uh, weighed at various times in the three decades. And the results were that people tended to drop, adopt the weight of their significant social networks. The person's chances of becoming obese increased 57% if he or she had a friend who became obese in a given interval. So what, so what this means is that even on a subconscious level, we are, want to be connected, and we want to be likely, like our community. And when it becomes to trading success and wealth, this creates big differentials. 
So the question is, how strongly do you feel connected to your community or communities? What is the average income of those in your closest community? What is the range of wealth or income of individuals in your most connected community? How different is your desired income from those you care about? Now, we ask these questions in the Wealth Dependent Score Assessment. And you can take this assessment online, and I'll give you the link at the end of the presentation so you can get your own score on this scale. If your goal as a trader will put you in significantly different wealth status than your family and friends, you can support your success by visualizing what you have and how you're going to maintain the relationships that are important to you. You can do this multiple times to help soothe the fear of abandonment. Journal the process, journal the reactions, and how you manage them as much detail as you can. Okay, let's stop for a moment, Fernando. Uh, questions that are coming in that um, would be good to explore a bit. Um, I have one here. I'm taking hypnotherapy because mm -hmm. I started having panic attacks, tachycardia, chest pain, and so on. Mm -hmm. It has been really helping me. Any advices on improving that and becoming more fearless surpass these fears? Okay, so that brings us to our golden keys, and we're going to talk about them in a bit. And the first is just awareness. So when, especially awareness, exactly when the panic attack starts, the, the closer you can get to just that moment, when you just start to notice it, when you just feel the slightest, teeniest bit of that starting, and then to notice, so what created this? How did I do this? So you notice I'm giving you ownership of it that you created. It's not something from the outside. That's an important concept. So it's for, it could be the thought. In fact, if I'll, I'll give a personal example, as I was giving a presentation and there was some disagreement in it, and I noticed that just the start of tension, and if it had gone full blast, it would have gone to a panic attack. But the phrase that, that triggered that was, I'm inadequate. So I, Rich Friesen, had the thought, in a moment, I'm inadequate here. And that triggered it. So if you can, just when that first bit of it starts, see how you trigger it. See how you create it. Now, once you have ownership of the panic attack, once you have ownership of how you create it, then you can start to make other choices. One of the precepts that we use at the Mind Muscles Academy is that we always move to our higher and higher self. And we move to our higher self by creating awareness immediately in the situation of what's going on. We accept that the panic attack in this example is there for positive intent. It's there to warn us. It's there to help us. It's there to keep us safe. We don't judge ourselves for it. We don't try to reduce the panic attack. We accept it. Then we can say, okay, I'm aware of it. I accept it, and now what would I prefer instead? So that's a deeper process. In fact, if you want to email me, I'll give you the email address at the end, and we can maybe talk about that a bit more. Okay, so we've looked at community constraints. Now let's look at the internal wealth thermostat. And if you will recall the story I told earlier about my own $200,000 thermostat and how it limited my income, if you remember that, well, everyone has a thermostat. Its settings can change from week to week, from year to year. Wherever your thermostat is set, that's okay. Higher isn't better, lower isn't worse. But the important point is to know where it is. I discovered mine when a voice woke me up in the middle of the night, but you can discover yours intentionally. We have exercises to help uncover this awareness in our conversations with money course. But this is just initial awareness excuse me, but just this initial awareness may help benefit many traders here today. Where is yours set? We have the perfect laboratory of what happens when people earn more money than their internal thermostat settings. Here's a list of athletes and lottery winners that went broke, lost everything, or went bankrupt. And I'll go through this list quickly. Eddie Curry, 60 million. Latrell Sprewell, 62 million. John Daly, 60 million. Uh, Iyer, 10 million, broke after that. McCartney, 10 million. Reese, 20 million. Anderson, 60 million. Best, 100 million, all broke. Mike Tyson went from 300 million to $700 before he came back. 
In addition to sports, we have lottery, which provides money beyond the recipient's identity and thermostat. Kelly Richard Rogers was 16 years old when she won a, won a $3 million British lottery drawing. Six years later, the 22-year-old mother of two said she'd blown almost all the money. Most of the cash disappeared on spending sprees, but she estimated she dropped 400000 on cocaine alone. Winning the lottery has ruined my life. I wished I had never won. Jack Whittaker uh, lost all his money, and in the process of all that money, the uh, loss of his wife and death of his daughter. Edwards won $441 million in a Powerball game took home $27 million in August 2001. Six years later, the money was gone, and he was evicted from a storage unit that he was living in. Michael Carroll uh, collected $50 million. Eight years later, he had blown, blown the money on drugs, gambling, and prostitutes. Now he's back to his job as a garbage collector. We can't be smaller than our money. Lottery winners, if we look at how many have financial struggles after a few years. NFL, National Football League players. The NBA, National Basket Basketball Association players. Some make it. Some make adjustments. Some improve their internal thermostat. And some are unable to do that. And this is what I just originally brought me here, to see traders who work so hard spend years of their life perfecting their skills, their strategies, and then something is missing. Their equity curve does not represent what they've accomplished, who they are, what they know about the markets. Trading is so powerful. You can make so much money once your strategy is clear, your execution is seamless, that some traders fall into the same trap as lottery winners and sports figures. So here's an example. If you put on a trade that has a 50-50 chance of success, it risks 500 to make 1,000. That's a pretty good bet. But what if your thermostat is set at 250? What happens when the opening trade, open trade starts to make more money than that? Unless we reset our thermostat, we tend to self-sabotage. We start to worry about losing money, and we take our profits too soon. The 50-50 bet now becomes a $500 risk for a $250 profit. Reminds me of a story. When I was on the building my trading firm, one of the new traders on the floor wanted to quit after making $10,000 in a single morning. It was one of those rare days that the market was just pouring money into our trading account. The uh, firms were selling premium and the retail was buying it. <laughs> oh my gosh. You have to take advantage of those days because the market will also deliver series of days where it wants to deplete your account at the same rate. But this trader had surpassed his internal profit limit. I told him I was going to zero out his account right now that day, and he was starting all over with no profits. That temporary fix allowed him to keep trading, and then we worked on his internal limits later. But taking profits too quickly is also a symptom of this larger scale equity curve problem. So again, Fernando, questions and comments to date. Um, I have a couple one here. Um, does the process of questioning work in finding these deep limiting beliefs? Yes, that's one process that's very helpful. Uh, in fact, there's an exercise we do where we uh, ask a question and then we say, and what's beyond that? And what's beyond that? Or, for example, let me think of an example. Uh, somebody who canceled a stop. What was going on when you canceled the stop? What was driving that answer? What was driving that answer? And what was driving that answer? And if you have somebody doing that and being persistent, sometimes the trader will fumble around and not know, but all of a sudden they'll start to say, I was afraid I would lose. And what's driving that? My father won't respect me. And what's driving that? I don't feel worthwhile as a person. So great comment on asking questions. So there's a methodology to that that can help uh, uncover those things that are standing in our way and in our success. So great question. Any others, Fernando? Yes, yeah, so I have another one here. Um, trading for more than a decade and want to give this one more shot. 
Um, I noticed fear creeping due to lack of success in trading in the past. What do you suggest so I could feel grounded every day before and after trading? Yeah, we have a, an exercise I call the bubble. And the bubble exercise, just briefly, is first of all, knowing what the trader's mindset is, what your highest level of behavior is. And once you know that, and we spend a lot of time working on the master trader's mindset, and if you can define that for yourself or discover moments in the past where you had it, then what I have people do is put some painter tape, uh, the blue painter's tape in the U.S. or a rope or a cloth or something that they have to step over or under or curtains they have to uh, part to get to their trading desk. And you only do that when you're well-grounded, when you're in the flow, when you're not needy, when you're in your highest mindset. If you're not, then you don't step to your desk. So we only step to our desk and we only trade when we're in our highest mental state. Great question. Anything else, Fernando, yeah, before we move on? One more here. Um, do you think family or friends have a higher influence on your wealth uh, relationship? Yes, because we, depending on our need to belong, you see, genetically, when we were in, in, a, in our tribal states, that if we were abandoned by our tribe, we would die. And as a result, we all have a genetic heritage that is hardwired in our brain that abandonment means death so even though it's way deep in our survival brain way out of our consciousness if we start to trade and become successful and part of our brain says whoa we're going to be uh uh we possibly have a threat of of not being connected to those who are, to, are, who are important to us in our community, that there will be subconscious um, takeovers of our behaviors and we'll start trading outside of our strategies. Great question. Okay, so let's talk about a third segment is dealing with guilt. Yes, old fashioned guilt. <laughs> okay. I grew up a Christian evangelical. My father was a preacher. You know, some grew up with Catholic guilt, Jewish guilt, uh, moral guilt, all sorts of guilt that were just drummed into us when we were younger. Some of us may not have much of this, but do you have any hidden guilt? Well, there are many factors that create guilt around money, and many of those we adopt from our family of origin. Some have been adopted from our religious or spiritual beliefs. Some of the guilt has been absorbed from our current culture, which is demonizing wealthy people. Some guilt for traders is that we're really good people. And I must say, I don't know how this happens, but the clients that come to me, especially in private coaching, they are good people with good hearts. They care. They're loving. They want the world to be a better place. I, I just don't have greedy people that comes to me. Maybe they, they self-filter out. But as a result of being good people, earning enormous sums, sums of money without delivering to values to others just feels plain wrong. Now, some of us are fairly guilt-free, and some of us have a heavy burden. For example, one of my clients had the subconscious belief inherited from his father that hard work was the only way to make money. Anything else was cheating and immoral. Thus, when he was at peace with himself and rapport with the markets and was making a lot of money, the belief felt that this was very, very wrong. And then he would create an impulse to trade and give it all back. You feel bad when your team crushes a rival? No, because they belong to the other tribe. We feel no pity. However, when it comes to taking a victory lap when trading, we rob ourselves of the joy of crushing the opponents. One mechanism that we use to create guilt is by adopting the pie model of money. In this model, when you have more money, somebody else has less. Well, this would be true if the world was a rhubarb pie. There's a ton of cash in the country, trillions of dollars of it, but it's a finite amount. There's only so much cash, and it's not theirs. Michael Moore is right. At any given moment, there is only so much cash. 
Michael Moore is an articulate spokesman for the One Pi model. If you have this model running in a program in your brain, that's okay. I'm not here to try to change your model of social economic justice. But it's important to know what model you do have. And one way to gain awareness is to look at these words and notice your physiological and emotional reaction. As I say each phrase, notice any changes in your physical sensations, your feelings, or your thoughts. Take a moment to check in with yourself right now. Let's establish a baseline. I'm going to do this myself. Notice your physical sensations that I'm noticing. I'm a little hunched over and a little tense, such as I'm noticing my breathing is a bit shallow. My muscle tension in my legs is a little tight. Okay, so I have a baseline. I'm noticing how I'm feeling right now, which is pretty excited and uh, really enjoying this presentation. So I'm going to read these words and notice any shifts or changes. Fairness. Distributing the wealth. Equality. Income gaps. Wealth distribution. Privilege. Share of wealth. The 1%. Hey there, fair share. Just notice if he had any changes or reactions emotionally, physiologically, any thoughts you had about this. It's important because if you have subroutines that are strong, even if you had just noticed a slight change, that means there's something going on there. And that voice can send you a note every time you make money. And the note might say something like, excuse me, you just took money from someone who may deserve it more. You may not even be aware of this message but it will impact your trading decisions. And I know this because I've worked with traders and this, these are the types of issues we come into time after time after time. And shifting this model can have a big impact on your success. A different model is the more is more model. Not to be confused with the Michael Moore model, which more is more. The more we value, uh, we as an, We've, the more we value the, how we deliver value to each other, the more wealth we all have. No one loses, everyone wins. The amount of value we, can, we deliver to our family, our friends, our neighbors, and community in the world is just infinite. Now, I'm going to talk a bit about in a minute about how we as traders contribute. It's just the tip of the iceberg. But if you agree with me or not, that doesn't matter. What does matter is the economic model you have running in your conscious or subconscious will affect your motivation and effectiveness as a trader. And this is because as good people, we don't want to damage others and we want to do good. In my own personal model of economics, when you give somebody money for goods or services, you do so because what you receive from them in return is worth more than the paper money you give them. If somebody gives you money for goods and services, the money is worth more than, to you than the services you're delivering. In fact, you both receive more value for the transaction than you're giving up. I think of money as certificates of appreciation. As traders, the value we add to the marketplace and hence to the larger economy is constantly moving price to value. I know that liquidity to the markets is the value, but I believe the information you give to the market is of greater value. For example, if you go long and the market goes up, you've just done the market a service. You've moved the price, even just a teeny bit with a one lot towards value. The market says, oh, Rich, you just moved the market closer to value in that moment. Here, let me reward you with some profits. If, on the other hand, you go long and the market goes down, You've moved the market away from value. And the market says, oh, Rich, you just moved the market away from value. And that's okay. I don't care. But you're going to have to pay for giving the market bad information. What you're doing as a trader is continually giving the market information. Successful traders give the market excellent information and are rewarded handsomely. Unsuccessful traders give the market bad information and you have to pay a penalty for that. You as a trader are really 
in the information business. And there's a reason why training is a sustainable career for the long term. There's a reason why the market pays you money. There's a reason why you're adding value to the economy. There's a reason for you with your intention, your skill, to build a trading practice. And going even deeper, it's a realization that justification isn't even needed. The market is there, and we can trust that it served us all. Or over time, it wouldn't have survived. The pie model of economics deserves a pie in the face. If you want to stop fighting, your brain is a traitor. Okay, and we'll stop for quite any questions um, up until now, Fernando. Uh, I have one here regarding the, um, the courses. Uh, mm -hmm. What level of English is required? Um, my English compre comprehension is not excellent. Um, I prefer to read. Mm -hmm. Do you have uh, any subtitle material? Sure. We have a course, um, um, Compass 2.0, that you can take on your own. And it uh, certainly, uh, the, all the translation, Google translation services can take care of that. So I'll talk about that in a bit, but that's an excellent question because uh, over 50% of our clients are not US citizens. And I'd say about 30%, uh, and some of them are British, but I'd say maybe 30, 40%, uh, English is a foreign language and we've always uh, worked with that. So great question. And if you have any question, more questions, you can always email me, and I'll give you my email address in just a bit. I have okay. another one here. Okay. Um, I, want, I want you to help me develop a master's trader mind, uh, mindset. Mm -hmm. What do mm -hmm. you want me to do to start this process? Okay. Well, that is about the best um, lead into the final slides that I could possibly ask for. So hang on just a second here. So Mind Muscle's core foundation is rapport. Rapport with all our internal biases, beliefs, values, and identity. Rapport with the markets. Rapport with our families. Rapport with our fellow employees. Rapport with the world at large. And I want to invite you to a path that ends internal struggles around money and wealth. We start with awareness as we bring our conflicts, beliefs, biases, and old patterns of behaviors to our conscious mind. We tease these often subconscious patterns to light with acceptance and understanding. Next, we intentionally create new actions, new behaviors that serve us better. Want more rapport with money, with trading success, your values and ethics, your markets, your relationships? If so, I'm inviting you right now to let me know. And we are starting Tuesday, April the 30th at 6 p.m. Eastern Time, we're going to have a conversation with Money Course. There are going to be eight sessions where we go into depth on each one of these issues. That includes working with our brains, discovering hidden biases, reframing money and success, creating our own values, releasing yourself from blame and shame, finding peace in a divided world, and figuring out how to deliver value and make your own contributions. These are live meetings. We have hot seat conversations where one person will say something like, well, I uh, had a three losing trades in a row and I all of a sudden went on tilt. I started just doubling up to try to make the money back. I went crazy and at the end I've lost an entire month's profits. So then we will go into somebody asked earlier about asking questions we will look and dig down and to find out what behaviors what beliefs what neural connections in the brain what triggers are driving that so that we can come to the place where we've improved our awareness we've improved our acceptance of what we found and creating new behaviors that work better well these uh, meetings are live meetings where we all meet on webcam or tablet video we support each other in our discoveries about how we've limited ourselves, our old habits, and our mindsets while we create new beliefs and behaviors that feel better, honor our values, and get us to our goals. Uh, during this, you'll also have access to my almost completed book, but you'll have full access to conversations with money, and we'll have chapter reading assignments each week. 
So the question is, would you like to have fun while expanding your ability to create and handle large, um, larger amounts of money? Are you interested in learning more about how to end your money issues? Well, you can fill in a form, and I'll give you the link right now. Uh, but to do that, I need to stop. Uh, can I get to that? No, I need to stop to share for a bit in order to put the link into the box. So I'm going to stop to share. And open up my links here. So if you're interested in this, there's no commitment right now. I'm only going to start the course if uh, there is enough interest. So there's the link. I just put it into the chat window, and you can copy that. And if you're interested, you can uh, put your name and email address, and we'll keep you posted on on that while well, i have this open you can also uh if anything particular you want to make an appointment with me uh there's my appointment calendar i'm happy to talk to anybody for about 15 minutes or so to find out how i can help you out we have more resources on our website and i'll put that in there And see, Robert Gordon says, don't see the link. Oh, to all panelists. That's the problem. Oh, OK. Let me do this again. Uh, I have to change the drop down to all panelists and attendees. So there's the link to the uh, indications of interest. If you're interested in following up on this Conversations with Money course, um, uh, you can put your name and email there. There's the link to my personal calendar. There's the link to our website with more resources. And let me give you my email address here, too. And I mentioned, oh, that's right. I mentioned earlier that uh, there's an assessment you can take. So let me put the assessment here, too. OK, there we go. So you can take that assessment. Uh, just copy the, uh, the link. OK, so I'm going to go back now and share the screens. Uh, to do that, I have to hit Escape. Share screen two. Share slideshow from current slide. There we go. So if you have the indications of interest, you have uh, the, the links in the chat window. You can copy those now because that the chat window will obviously disappear after, after we end the webinar. So what we have available for you, uh, a number of things. is private coaching, our Compass 2.0 course, which is an online course you take on your own speed at your own time. Uh, we have guided visualizations. Somebody mentioned about stepping into their higher self, their master trader's mindset. We have guided visualizations that do that. We have a Stop Fighting Your Brain ebook, and we have free blogs if you want to sign up for our newsletter. Um, so all those things are available, and we do want to continue to support you. Um, and I already gave you the assessment link to the wealth relationship. I just put that in there. So now I'm open for questions. It's exactly one hour we've been here. I'm willing to stay for a while and answer questions. So Fernando, we can start at the top. I'm willing to have a chat here and answer anybody's questions and stay as long as we need. Mm -hmm. So I have another one here. So uh, I discovered I have guilt uh, for money I have taken from my mother. Mm -hmm. um, I thought by this point my, in my life, I would be the one providing for her. How mm -hmm. can I release this guilt issue? Okay, so guilt has a positive intent for our lives. It's intent to help us behave better or feel better about ourselves. But what also happens is that it keeps just hammering us consciously and, and subconsciously and in ways that don't produce different behaviors or beliefs. 
So then the, there's questions. First, is there something that I want to change in the real world? For example, if I had guilt about stealing money from somebody, uh, would I return the money? So there's the real world issues. And secondly, the process of the guilt itself does not help out. I mean, it doesn't make us more creative. It doesn't make us more worthwhile. It doesn't provide uh, more creativity or help us in our relationships. It is optional suffering. So we look at the purpose of that guilt. So, if, for example, in a private session, we would go and look at what was the positive intent of that and then look at a new belief, a new mindset that would set us free from that. And that's a longer involved process. But uh, send me an email and I'm happy to look at that or maybe we can have a brief discussion about that. So I have another one here um, about a, something you said before uh, when you talk about when we step to our desk, what is um, what it is that we should have um, consciousness. He, he, he skipped the word. He don't remember mm -hmm. what you what you said exactly. Okay. Well, this is really an important focus. What you just brought up. And I remember the uh, slide with the uh, circles where the one was filled with all the behaviors that no longer serve us, and then the other circle was blank. When I, a trader comes to me for private coaching, I'll say, okay, what are the issues? And he'll say, oh, I impulse trade. I make money for three or four days, or I'll lose a couple, three trades, and I'll just get furious, and I'll just trade to try to make it back, and then the duck. So I'll say, okay, great. What would you like instead? Well, what I'd like is just, uh, you know, to follow my plan. I just, I just get frustrated, and when I have a couple, three losing trades in a row, it just puts me on tilt, and then I go crazy. And I say, okay, and what would you like instead? Well, I'd just like to not feel so angry. I just get so frustrated. Okay, and what you would you like instead? And, and somebody had asked about a series of questions. Well, that, those, again, are a series of questions. What we're trying to get to is what positive state of mind would you step into? And this will take sometimes, sometimes, it sometimes just takes a while to develop. And after a while, I, I say, and what would you like instead? And then we start, I'd like to feel peace while trading. I'd like to feel in the flow. Okay, how do you know you're at peace? How do you know you're in the flow? What are the physiological representations of that? Oh, I'm breathing easy, I'm relaxed. Oh, great. So what you would like is to feel easy, relaxed, and in the flow while you're trading. Is that right? Yes, I'd like to feel easy, relaxed, and in the flow while I'm trading. Great. So now we have something positive to move into. In fact, uh, what I did is I created a guided visualization called the Trader's Home. It's about, I think, a 30-minute guided visualization, and it helps step you into the mindset of your highest self, of the trader, master trader's mindset. And that's uh, on our website. You can go to mindmusclesfortraders.com and find it there. And that'll, that'll help too. The most important point is for you to create your own unique highest self, your master trader's mindset, to know what are the uh, symptoms of that, to know when you're in your body, what, what, what is that like, so that you can know when you're there and when you're not there. What you can do is set an alarm for every 10 minutes or 5 minutes or 20 minutes or whatever. And then when the alarm goes off, just notice your physiology. Am I tense? Am I hunched over? Is my breathing tight? Are my thigh muscles tight? Are my shoulders tight? Next, notice your emotion. Am I frustrated? Am I angry? Am I feeling peaceful? Am I feeling joy? And then notice the quality of your thoughts. Are you self-critical? Are you hammering yourself? Are, you delight, are your thoughts delightful and curious? So what you can do then is just start to note. We have an application called Mind Metrics, which takes that uh, and takes it a dozen steps further in order to really measure what matters. Measure all the symptoms that create the master trader's mindset. But you can do that on your own. You don't need a fancy uh, application to do that is just to become, remember the golden keys, just to become aware of what's going on in the moment, to accept that, 
not to judge yourself for it, but to fully accept that. And then, like I asked my traders, and what would you like instead? So I have a, another one. Um, can I uh, prep myself, my mindset, so I could be best prepared for this course? Yes, well, we will have people who sign up for the course. Uh, what we do is we send out some preparations. We send out uh, some exercises. And so uh, we take care of all that. We have a path. We, we did our beta course last year. So this one is, uh, we learned a lot from that. So we'll take care of everything. And then once you sign up, then uh, we will create a path for you to prepare yourself. Um, do you follow Tony Robbins, an advocate of NLP? Yeah, Tony's an interesting guy. Um, and there is a lot of criticism, a lot of good stuff. And I believe that he has value and you need to sort that value from the salesmanship and the hype. And because uh, he's really good at what he does. And if you are secure enough in yourself that you can say, hey, this is great. Oh, that doesn't work for me. Then I think it's, uh, he's worthwhile. But you need to take care of yourself in the process, just like you need to take care of yourself with mind muscles or anybody else. Because ultimately, you're responsible for yourself. And taking that responsibility in and of itself is a huge step forward. Um. Do you, do you believe in the law of attraction? <laughs> yes and no. Okay, so there's, there's you know, there's the What the Bleep movie, and there's a number of people, <clears throat> and some people I know very well and very close to, who believe in manifesting, um, who have a vision board, who believe in the law of attraction, and we create our own worlds around us. I was in a group recently where I was kind of grumpy and not feeling part of the group and nobody talked to me and, and I felt isolated and, and whatever. And then a week later, I went to a similar group and felt outgoing and confident and wanted to connect with people. And my God, everyone was friendly and wanted to connect with me and three or four people wanted to talk to me. My God, what a difference. So, yes, our state changes the world on the outside. The challenge I have with manifesting in the law of attraction is if it's like we sit and say, okay, I'm going to manifest $10,000. I'm going to attract $10,000. I'm going to manifest $10,000. i am going to check. Oh, it didn't happen. What's wrong with me? I grew up a Christian and evangelical, and uh, I'd often pray for things in a very similar way. And when they didn't happen, the preacher would say, well, that's because you didn't believe or God answered no. But what we really want to do, in my opinion, and what's most meaningful and what I'd like to invite you to do is say, rather than attracting things, what can I do for others? What value can I deliver to the market? We talked about information you're delivering to the market. What value can I deliver to others? Now, all of a sudden, that shift makes a huge difference. Rather than on one extreme, sitting and waiting for somebody to give us money, on the other, going out in the world and creating value for others. And that value then can attract money. Great question. I'm glad you brought it up. Um, the issue I have... <clears throat> Sorry, uh, the, the issue I have is I can't commit to a trading, uh, trading strategy. Mm -hmm. I jump from a technical trading strategy to a price action strategy. Mm -hmm. Now I'm looking uh, at Peter Davies' order flow. Mm -hmm. I believe that, uh, that the mind is very important, but if my strategy doesn't work, I would doing uh, your mind course help my trading. Excellent. Well, first, let me say that our most successful traders do use uh, Jigsaw Peter Davies' order flow. But that seems to be a strategy that, and that everyone brings their own stuff to it and different things and different time frames and different asset classes and all that. But I see a general tendency to move towards that, and I think that's really positive. And what we do in the, this course is not work on a particular strategy, 
uh, what we're doing, if we, well, Compass 2.0 uh, works on executing our strategy, and that's an online course you can take on, on your own. The Conversations with Money live course where we're going to do eight live sessions, that works with your underlying beliefs and biases to set the stage so that when you do uh, create a successful strategy, that you won't have the angers around it, around subconscious beliefs. Um, I don't see any more questions okay. here. Um, well, Fernando, can I give you an appreciation? Uh, sure. Yeah, I really appreciate working with you, bringing up the questions, the great introduction, and bringing the jigsaw traders to to this format and you just did a great job of uh, managing this and making it really delightful and easy for me so thank you thank you sir um trying my best here my english sometimes fails me but um i hope every, everybody understands me uh perfectly well i think uh, i certainly did and i'm sure everyone else did too so i'd like to also give everyone who showed up here an appreciation for taking time to look at what is in fact sometimes hidden or sometimes unbelievable and to really open your hearts and minds to the, the possibility of stepping into your master trader's mindset, stepping into yourself as a wealthy, successful person and looking at the issues that are stopping you. So my appreciation for everyone who showed up. Uh, please look at the links and uh, if you need have any questions or comments, you can email me or you can look at the, the links and sign up there. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Fernando. Um, thank you, Richard. Thank you, Peter, yeah, Peter Davies, who uh, did all this work in creating the Jigsaw order flow uh, systems so that uh, more and more traders can benefit. So thanks, everybody. Take care, and have a most wonderful waking day. And thank you, everybody, to showing up, and we hope uh, to see you all uh, next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.